I think you're a very important musician. And I honestly believe if you continue what you're doing, if we go back and watch a concert together in 10 years, the audience will look nothing like the audiences look today. A lot of gray hair will be replaced by young people who are coming to feel something, not to sit and witness history. I keep thinking about this song. Uh, maybe we can sing together. <laughs> This has been a magical treat for me, I can't even tell you. Anastasia, I can't tell you what a treat it is to sit down with you. I know. Um, I invited you onto the podcast um, as an act of total selfishness, um, because I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, and to be able to sit with you with your magical Stradivarius cello um, is such a treat. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for your invitation. What a uh, treat for me. <laughs> I'm a huge classical music fan. I grew up listening to it. Um, uh, I have friends who are musicians. And one of the things that's confounded classical music more than I think most of the other arts is how to keep it alive and keep it fresh for young people. You know, one of the big challenges that, you know, some of the big orchestras have is their subscribers are just dying. <sighs> Yeah, but on other side, um, imagine you are uh, turning 65 or 70 or 60, your kids are already grown up, uh, where would you go? Rock concert? But Maybe I, but classical concert yes, is, yes, but, is the, but, the place where you would uh, spend your evening. No? But, this is, but this is something that I think that you are doing that's actually very important, which is how I discovered you. I discovered you <laughs> in a very modern way on the Instagram. <laughs> Uh, and you were playing the third movement of Vivaldi's uh, A minor cello concerto. I think that's the one, yeah. right? The A minor. Um, and you did it differently than it's usually done. You were banging on your cello, <laughs> and you were giving it a youth and a vitality that that is un uncommon, right? You don't bang on your cello when you play it. That's not normal. Um, and I, I posted it. I reposted your clip. And the number of people who fell in love with it, and I, and then your then your album came out, and I sent that piece to a lot of friends, and the number of people who aren't into classical music, who fell in love with that piece, um, I think is a gateway drug, and so I think you're doing. I don't know if you even realize this, if this was your intention, but you're opening up classical music to people to appreciate that it can be fun, that it's not always serious. Because classical music is fun, yes. just as any other music, yeah. It's, it's just how to find the approach. I think, um, in a way, in classical music there is everything what you find in the pop music. There is beautiful melodies, haunting harmonies. The whole content is there, it's just the form. Sometimes symphony is 40 minutes, yeah. uh, concerto, and you know, there's a lot of certain mm, frames and rules that sometimes make it difficult to new public to access it, and uh, uh, yeah. So I want to talk more, but I think for people who don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> can you play that movement and have as much fun as you want uh, to have? Yeah, I can. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's such magic. It, I have to believe that in Vivaldi's time, that was rock and roll. Yeah. Well, we don't know how it will be, uh, how it was, but the energy of the music, the pulsation, the yeah, the, this carrying uh, waves of music, they are almost physical. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. Uh, Oh, it's the it best. It corresponds to us, the humans of today. Yeah. When did you start banging on your cello? <laughs> because I wanted to play a percussion instrument, and uh, it's just, you know, that just came naturally. We were uh, jamming with the orchestra and recording this, uh, this movement, and, uh, you know, I didn't know how it will turn out. Because everybody just suddenly we got into this flow of improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the violins were adding some trills over there, and uh, suddenly uh, uh, the uh, I, I felt I found myself just doing. And yeah. you know, it was just the music that was inviting us yeah. to add more, to to yeah, to to get free yeah. of the rules of the frames. Yeah. So how how old were you when you started playing cello? I was four. It was four. A, it was a baby cello, and. Uh, I uh, uh, I was just basically, you know, um, I didn't like to play with the bow, it was too boring. So I was just uh, playing the pizzicato and singing to it. And, and your dad's a composer, right? So yeah. you grew up with music in the house, obviously. And did you want to play an instrument or did they sort of highly encourage you <laughs> as a four-year-old to play one? Well, it was just uh, fun of making music. You so you know, enjoyed uh, it? I enjoyed to sing, to dance, to play a little bit of cello. I didn't practice, you know, mm. what it, it means that repeating the piece. And, and then when did you start, uh, how old were you when you started actually realizing that you were good and that you were actually taking it seriously? Mm, maybe at the age of nine or ten. Okay, yeah. so still pretty, pretty young. Yeah, I think the pieces get, just got more complicated. So yeah. I realized to, to be... Uh, to feeling good on stage, I maybe need to start to practice. Uh, first of all, just maybe bef before the the concert, just a little bit. Then maybe one day before, <laughs> two days before. Yeah. Wait, wait, say that again. You only practice two days before the concert? Yeah, I I realized that to be good, I have to maybe start a little bit in advance. Oh know, yeah, two to, days, to a little bit, yeah. sure, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so I mean, I think that is fair to say, and I think this has been said of you that you are a prodigy or you were a prodigy because to be to have that kind of talent that you practice two days before the concert and still pull it off <laughs> at the age of 10 at the age yeah. of 10 yeah i think you know there's a there's an inherent raw talent in there that that is exciting and rare i think it's a lot of environment and the support of parents of course what, what the others see in you yeah. as a child and uh, then you of course uh, focus on this and you see that you can um, you can be different you can become get more love also with, with playing cello yeah all the uh, all little uh, uh, humans are of course seeking for the love and attention and cello was also my uh, um, tool of getting this be different and I had fun it was not, uh, it's not it was not hard work for me so you grew up uh, you're, you're from Russia yeah uh, you live now in Germany yeah, about uh, 12 years. 12 already, years in Germany. Since, yeah. um, and you live a life as a solo musician, um, a soloist, uh, which means that you perform as a guest usually. You're not in an orchestra. You're, you're not, you don't have a regular day job in an orchestra. It's a hard, I mean, what I know of that life, it's a hard life. You're on the road a lot, right? Because you play by invitation. Yeah. And so you, and the invitations come from all over the place. And then you'll play for, what, three or four days? you probably go a little earlier to rehearse? Yeah, there is um, one day of rehearsal, and usually next day there is a concert. Of course, because I remember you don't need more than a day or two before. <laughs> so, so you Stay just like this. <laughs> so you come for a day before for rehearsal. Obviously, if it's a difficult piece, you'll do some work before. Yeah. And then you have the performance, which is between one or three performances. Something like this, yeah. And then you leave. And then that's a very short encounter. You yeah. have to find the chemistry between uh, between 80 musicians in the orchestra and the conductor. You have to find the way of approaching this piece because, of course, we studied, everyone studied this at home. Yeah. And then we meet, we have the scores, and uh, there is a conductor, and we have to find this common language. But it's the lifestyle that I'm interested in because the only other profession that has that lifestyle are comedians. Mm-hmm. Where it's just you're just 
your career requires you to just be on the road all the time. Um, how does that affect you? How does that affect your energy, your social life, your ability to maintain friendships, relationships? You know, just like the desire to play music is, is and, and the lifestyle that is required to play music, to perform at least, they don't seem in simpatico. One is about being present and the other one is being on the road. You know, it's in airports and trains. Just tell me a little bit about sort of the life that you live. I don't think people appreciate how difficult it is to be a soloist in classical music. Yeah, probably when you're doing this every day, you're not very much <laughs> looking at this from a side. And uh, uh, yeah, I think the everyday challenge is, uh, um, for me, is uh, this preparation to the concert. You know, I want to be in my best at the concert moment, you know, when I come to the public, I want to feel my strengths. I want to feel the desire of being open and sharing the music. But sometimes I just wake up and I feel introvert. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just uh, don't feel uh, like leaving my bed. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this is all this ways of uh, also psychologically preparing, my, preparing myself for the concert because um, every time it's never the same. And uh, I, I have, of, of course, my doubts and uh, um, some weaknesses that I know I have. But in the moment of the concert, when I perform for the public, I have to feel uh, just so open, you know, just feeling the light that is going from my chest yeah. and uh, this desire of sharing all these emotions that are in the music. Yeah. And um, uh, it's, it's like a one way from one concert to another, the preparation uh, that I, uh, you know, there is, a, there is certain point that I'm approaching and I feel how I approach with it, you know, how, how I get uh, uh, anxiety, or how I get my heart beating faster towards the concert, how, uh, mm, yeah, what, what, how I feel today about standing there, vulnerable, open, mm. and uh, desiring for this connection, mm. desiring for this... L uh, communication with mm. the people because mm, often we, we s people think that uh, being in a concert it's a passive thing not at all I can exactly tell of how people are listening to me it's it's like telling a story to someone you can you you can tell how the other one is listening if it's maybe every third word or half a year or is it really intensively go uh, somebody goes with you yeah. um, and uh, um, I always desire for this connection, and the people um, in every place are so different. Yeah. I mean, you're 29, right? Yeah. 29. So you're young in your career. You've got a long career ahead of you, and and and, and so you have the energy to do it. But and I can relate to what you're talking about. You know, when when I started speaking a lot, you know, the I can always tell, as you said, I can give the same speech over and over and over again. Like you can play the same piece over and over again, but it's different every time because it's the audience. And that's true. Actors talk about the audience, you know? How, you, how do you do a Broadway show the same time, the same thing every day, eight days a week, eight times a week? And it's, it's the audience and the desire to connect and bring my message and be fully present with the audience. And the, there was excitement leading up. But then I always remember coming home. It's just like, oh, and I just want to stay home. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to leave my house because I was out all the time. That Being home was magical. Um, and... The last thing I wanted, to, but the difference is, I think, the last thing I wanted to do was speak when I was at home. The last thing I wanted to do was have, you know, where you, do you play for yourself, by yourself? Sometimes. Less, but, less? But less, yeah. Of yeah. course, um, I have certain, certain deadlines, the pieces that I have to, like an athlete, you know, build uh, the strengths, build the muscles for, for this certain performance. And uh, I have to, of course, catch up. It's a different uh, music, different uh, music of pie pieces of music. So I, I look how I, you know, prepare them over the next months. Yeah, and get them in your fingers. Yeah. Where do you go when you play? Uh, it's the one thing that I've always loved about great musicians, which is 
and it's my one of my favorite things. And I think for people who haven't been to see live music, live classical music, when you see a soloist, there's something about a soloist or a, a great musician where, and this is, you could say this of rock and roll as well, or pop music, where they get completely lost in their music. When they start playing, they go somewhere. They're not just playing, they're not watching their fingers, they're not watching the bow. I mean, you, you close your eyes and I lose you while you're with your cello. Do you, do you, do you know where you go or do you just become, like, what, what, what happens when, when you start playing? I think it's like with other uh, activities in life, it's catching the flow. Yeah. And uh, when you're in this moment uh, of presence, uh, you're just in the now, not in the be- uh, not in the past or in the future. You're in this precious moment of now because this is the only way of making music. And uh, I. Uh, um, yeah, I, I I play the music that is written already, but I improvise because I can shape uh, something in so many different ways. Yeah, and uh, like saying one phrase, like saying one phrase. Yeah, you, you, like in, with the text, you Beautiful. have so many yes. things. And uh, for example, the um, um, the first, especially with music of Bach. Yeah, it's really eternal and you can play it in millions of variations yeah. for example the first prelude which is probably the most famous cello piece um. <laughs> completely different. I can play it. <laughs> or some other is shaping it differently, you know? It's uh, that's what is beautiful about the music, about uh, this uh, timeless pieces that yeah. you can you can always find reflection um, of your today's feeling of your life situation mm. in the music that you play and uh, you connect to your emotional uh, world and uh, this is also the beauty of music or beauty of listening music of ma- or making music mm. because you connect to your emotions and uh, this uh, I think is very necessary thing Are you better at telling us your emotions when you play cello or are you good at with your words like if you're trying to express anger or frustration or love to someone are you good with your words or is it better that you pick up your cello and I can know how you feel <laughs> probably I'm more clear with the cello yeah because the the, <laughs> the words are always tricky you know you can uh, you can always hide uh, your intentions with the so what is a Bach some... prelude when you're angry uh. <laughs> Um, uh. Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, well, it's hard to shape probably the first prelude. Of course, because it's, it's so yeah, it's, it's luscious. It's so peaceful. It's so. Of course, you find the music that fits uh, the mood. Yeah. Of course, of course. Oh, Shostakovich. It's always. Uh, Shostakovich is, Shostakovich, is the yeah. best, really, is the energy. Oh, yeah. So, but I think what you're capturing here is, you know, it's one. It's always been a pet peeve of mine when I say to people, "Oh, I love classical music," and they say to me, "Oh, I love classical music too. It's so relaxing." <laughs> and I was like, "No, like, no, like, yes, some of it is relaxing. Yeah. Some of it is lovely. But the stuff that I love, the stuff that I love, I don't like pretty music. You know, I think that we can just take the major key outside and shoot it." 
I love the minor key. <laughs> it's I I'm ha- very happy in the minor key, uh, and uh, I I talked about this once in a previous episode, but it's much easier when I have a musician. Can you just play just so that people know what we're talking about? Just play a quick phrase that's in the major key. Doesn't matter. Just so they understand what major does. Major is happy. It's lovely. <laughs> So, there you go. Major's lovely, happy, and now minor. More brooding, more serious. And this is why I love the minor key. It's just better. And... This is what I think is so magical about classical music, which is it's so broad, and there's so much there. There's stuff that's easy to listen to, there's stuff that's difficult to listen to, that's stuff that you can put in the background because it's just pleasant, like Pachelbel, blech. um, (laughs) Major key. (laughs) um, And there's stuff that literally you have to concentrate because it's really hard. Shostakovich is hard to listen to. If you're just learning classical music for the first time, you don't start with Shostakovich. It's too hard. You start with Mozart. But at some point you get rewarded. And you get, but you get to, and I love taking friends to the symphony for the first time. And I always tell them, you don't have to like every piece. You don't have to like every movement. I love the Beatles. I don't love every piece on every album, right? Um, You find the things you like. And it's like going to an art museum. You don't have to like every piece of art in the art museum. Find the piece you like and say, I like that one. And then find out who made it. And then go look at more of their work. And then find out who was making work at the same time and go look at... It's the same with music. Absolutely. It's an exploration. Exploration. To find what is reflecting in you, what is evoking your memories, your yeah. emotions, how, how this music corresponds with yeah. you. Let's play a little more music. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm going to choose another piece from your album because I love it. <laughs> It's the another short one, the Canto della. I don't even know how to say it. Canto de, della Bura, Buranella. Canto della de, de Rota. Yeah. So it's a, this is a not, not this is how old is this piece? How old? It's, how, uh, it's from the movie Casanova. Oh. So, so it's, it's new. Uh, yeah. Ah. But uh, since it's for two celli. You know, for I know. Yeah, you have to pick the one. And I to... have, uh, and I have, I made a little version when I sing and accompany. Ah. to me, like, like it was uh, at the very beginning when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, g- uh, l- wonderful. Pin pinin valentin panevin. Pin pinin valentin furegi. Le voci caprici di che che ieri la gera la gera pute. Le zeli voci caprici di che che ieri la gera la gera pute. So it's it's um the thing that is unusual about your album as a classical music album uh is it's rare to have one movement on an album usually it's a whole piece a whole piece a whole piece and for four. people who who so classical music you know a symphony usually has four movements a concerto usually has three movements is that right yeah <laughs> usually not always but you know And the three movements, one is fast, one is slow, one is something else. And you don't necessarily like all the movements, but they always make sure you have all the movements on the album. You didn't do that. Like that Vivaldi, for example. You didn't put the whole piece. You put one movement. What was your thinking to to be so selective and not, I, to not push out, you know, this? I just uh, took the best What I thought was the best, <laughs> and uh, because yeah. you know, in classical music, this is what I was saying about the old mentality. It's sacrilege. It's considered a yeah. sin to break a piece. <laughs> It, you know, yeah, to but, only play one movement and not the whole and not the whole piece. But at the times of Beethoven, Beethoven, for example, they had the separate pieces. Or, for example, Chopin. He never performed his uh, piano and cello sonata at the entire as the entire piece. 
he chose the second and the third movement as his favorites. And it was, you see it from the programs, there was just movement, oh, separate movements. I didn't movements. know that. So it's actually the old tradition, which is now, uh, yeah, seen a bit like, uh, oh, what? This 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 is not no no we we play the whole the entire thing we play the whole piece but this is why I think you're important and I said I'm going right back to the beginning of the of our conversation which is I think you're very very important for classical music because I think you're coming at it from a young person's point of view you're bringing Instagram I learned about you on Instagram you know you're bringing social media you're 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 changing the pieces to make them suit your mood. You're banging on your cello, you're singing along, you know? People, you're, you're doing things, you're putting one movement on an album because you like that movement better, you know? And I think what you're allowing new audiences to classical music, you, what you're showing them is you don't have to be a snob, you don't have to like it all, but if the musician herself says, no, I'm putting this one mu movement on my album because that's the one I like, then why do I have to listen to the whole piece? I can just go listen to the one movement that I like. And I think you're making music accessible. I really think what you're doing is probably bigger than you realize. Indeed. I, I, ne I never thought about this, you know. I was just doing what I felt was fun for me, yeah. you know. It's, it's uh, what you said It's uh, about the album. It's like playlist, you know. You put the... The things that you like, and uh, what I I took this album as a, as a playlist also to create something, a little Venetian portrait of music that I thought was uh, presenting it. That's genius. That's exactly what you're doing in a playlist society where we don't even buy albums, we buy songs. Yeah. We don't even buy music. We we stream it, yeah. and we make playlists of a piece oh, here, so, a piece yeah. there. We break things up. We mix genres. And we, we are a playlist society. We're not an album society anymore. And classical music is still stuck in an album mentality. When I go to the symphony, they play the first symphony, then they play the next symphony after the intermission, and I have to listen to two albums. But I, I don't even know if I've ever been to a, mu a concert where it's just a movement here and a movement there, unless it's, you know, a pops concert or something. And I think what you're doing is, is, is so important, which is you're bringing, you're modernizing the way we listen to music. And as you said, this is how they used to do it anyway. It's a playlist mentality for yeah. a playlist world. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> we just found a new term. Yes. Let's see, maybe in five or ten years, classical music will, <laughs> will no, change. No, I want, I want one of the big orchestras. Because one of the things that infuriates me about classical music is I want to go see a piece that I love. I mean whatever, a Beethoven symphony, right? And it's always the second half because they make me listen to some modern shit, <laughs> some cacophonous, awful music. And 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 I, I've had this debate with, uh, and for people who've ever gone to symphony, like literally it's very common for them to play something ultra modern that's really hard to listen to, that's, it's, it's very cacophonous, it's very difficult music, and you really have to be a musician, I think, to appreciate what's being played because as somebody who's not a musician it's just awful and i've had this debate with people who are in the music world why do i have to why do they put that on the program why do you force me to listen to that and they say it's very important that the, the symphonies keep this music alive so that people can be exposed to it like every now and then no problem but it's too much and so when i try and bring people and introduce them to classical music so much is this is difficult to listen to and it's not fun I'm, I, I don't know. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, it's just that uh, I want to say something in the uh, uh, in defense with, of, uh, of, of, contemporary, of contemporary <laughs> of music. <laughs> By the way, I don't dislike all contemporary music. I like a lot of contemporary music. Yeah, but it's like the art. It's you the cacophonic stuff. The cacophonous stuff. That what do you? What's the word? The when it's not a nice melody. Uh, yeah, it's dissonance. Dissonant. Dissonance. The dissonance. Dissonant music yeah. is. And again, now and then, I have no problem with. It. <laughs> it's that it's too much on the programs, which is alienating people from coming to concerts or coming yeah. back again. What about contemporary art? It's so difficult sometimes to connect to, uh, to certain uh, oeuvres, to certain installations. Yes, but I could walk past that in the yeah. museum and then go yeah. look at the thing that I like. I doesn't, the museum doesn't force me to stare at it for 25 minutes. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not against it. I'm just against, I, like I said, the, the way, way I, if they're going to experiment... And do new things, which we and is that what if that's their argument, right? Then why not play the f whole first half of a concert, a movement here, a movement there, thematic Venice, a movement here, a movement there, 
just like a good and you made an, an art argument a good curation is mm -hmm. a piece of picasso a piece yeah, of yeah. chagall and it's a, it's a it's a statement of a theme of an idea of a feeling told with many artists so why can't we do that on a stage you did it in your album why can't we do that on the stage well i hope that some music directors uh, are, are listening, listening to, to us to <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well you know classical music is uh, a bit behind yeah. some uh, the other arts yeah the other arts and uh, there is a lot less experimentation on a big stage yeah um, because the, maybe classical music is a definition of tradition mm. but um, uh, and there are some good things about traditions but there are also I think this is the good balance of there needs to be a good balance between mixing the tradition with a new ways new yes. approach new ways of presenting it to a uh, our modern times, you know, it's... I think you said it best, which is before we before we turned on the microphones, before we went live, we were talking about your cello. And your cello was, uh, remind me again, the year it was built? 1698. So the cello was, was made in 1698 by Antonio Stradivarius, and it is a beautiful, beautiful cello. And Stradivariuses have great reputations for their sound. They just sound, you know, musicians will tell you, we don't know what it is, they just sound better. And what we were talking about before the microphones went on is that you said that modern uh, instrument making is so good that if you close your eyes, it would be very hard to tell the difference between a modern cello that was made last week and a Strad. But you said something about why you keep playing an old instrument that I thought was magical. Yeah, it's a You're piece of art, piece I of history yeah. that is uh, carrying in it so so much and this ability of interact with it every day and uh, to share it with so many people you said to me you were playing history and i fell in love with that i'm playing history i mean can you imagine the, mon the number of people who have played on this instrument in hundreds of years and will be playing and will be playing it on hundreds of years after you yeah. you know good ones and bad ones uh and you're playing a piece of history it's not just the sound it's what it represents which I think is magical, but you said it right, which is, and we have to update it. You're banging on a Strad, you know, <laughs> as well you should. What, you. I've, you've been so gracious to play a few things that I've asked. Um, what, what do you, what do you, what, like when I write books, I don't have any desire to write unless I completely obsess about an idea. And when I'm obsessed, it's all I want to talk about. It's all I want to think about. It's all I want to read about. Then I was like, oh, I'm probably going to write about this at some point. Do you obsess about a piece? Do you become a, I mean, because I can become obsessed about a piece. Like I've listened to your 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 Vivaldi, uh, the the third movement. I cannot tell you how many times I've listened to it <laughs> on over and over and over and repeat. And, and like I'll go a week, and that's the only thing I'm listening to over and over and over again. It's, obs it's obsessive because it's so good. And you and by the way, I went and listened to other versions. Yours is the best. It's so good, right? It's improvised. It's so good. Whatever. It's so good, and. Uh, and I've gone and listened to the one on Instagram as well because it's different and it's so good. Your interpretation is so good. Do you, do you also become obsessed with a piece or a phrase that you just can't? Yeah, of course. Something that is, uh, I think it's very much about how I feel in this moment yeah. because we find the, uh, this, um, how to say, um, um, like a music track of the life, you know, yeah. of a certain period of life that is uh, just fitting the best. What are you obsessed with right now? What's the piece that you, whether you're performing it or not, whether you're, whether, whether you're recording it or not, it's the piece right now that you, when you pick up your cello and you're just sort of getting ready and you're, you're warming up your fingers, it's just the piece that you, you can't... What's the piece that, that is stuck in your head right now? If maybe you don't have one, but I'm so curious what's stuck in your head right now. It's um, it's also the piece with this, a bit of singing and uh, uh, by contemporary composer Petris Vasks. <laughs>
is hauntingly beautiful. And a different acoustics, it sounds so different than in the church. I just play, uh, played another concert wow. two, two days ago in a, in a church and I, I played it and uh, gave me goosebumps. Can you tell me a story from your life? Something you were part of, something you did. It doesn't matter if it was commercially successful or not. But something you did that you loved being a part of it. And if everything in your life was like this one thing, you'd be the happiest person alive. It's probably happening now by, uh, with this album Venice, the program that I chose, that I put together and uh, I have fully, uh, you know, shaped the concert experience and listening experience of my audience. And I don't get that every, uh, every time. Usually the, um, the program, the, the piece that I'm playing is chosen by the promoter and I'm asked to play it. And uh, there is certain, yeah, I, of course I like this music, but um, I didn't choose it myself. And with the program that I, uh, with the Venice, it's something that I, you know, it's my personal, it's, it's mine. And this is um, a very special feeling. And uh, I hope I will, I found this and I will, I will do more of that in the future, mixing different genres because music, music is music. You, I think one shouldn't separate it too much between the styles and genres. Yeah. I mean, you play some pieces that are from movies, you know, as well as with Vivaldi. Yes. And these famous classical composers. Tell me an early specific happy childhood memory, something I can relive with you. Something like I'm watching a movie, something that you can tell me, that you can relive with me. I remember that um, my uh, grandma was not feeling well, and uh, I think I was about six or seven, and uh, I... I felt I want to do something for her, and um, yeah, everybody was a bit concerned and uh, concerned, and there was some kind of tension moments. And uh, I thought, um, yeah, I, I can, I can console her best with the with the piece that I just, uh, you know, just learned. And uh, I remember uh, getting in the in her room and getting everybody out of <laughs> of her little room, closing the door. And just uh, just playing for her a little little piece that I just learned, and this is probably one of the moments when I realized that uh, you know one can say more sometimes with with music than with the words. Thank you. Um, what's beautiful about both of those memories, the one about the, the way you describe Venice, your album and the one that you describe about this experience you have when you're six or seven with your grandmother, in both cases, you chose what to play. In both cases, you used music as a way of communicating something that, and you said it, 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 it so many times throughout this conversation with you, so many times, I'll ask you a direct question, and you say, well, it depends what I'm trying to give my audience, it depends what I'm trying to help them feel. You keep talking about the audience, not about the composer or the musician. When I talk to other musicians, they talk about the music. They talk about what Beethoven intended, what you know Bach intended, and what they're trying to capture from history. You've mentioned none of that, and you've talked obsessively about the audience and how you are like your grandmother when nobody else knows what to do, this tension in the room, that you have the ability to speak a language that tells people exactly what they want to hear in the time they need to hear it which is why it makes total sense why you would break with convention to pull a movement from here or a piece that's old combined with a piece that's new because it's not about taking music and putting in formaldehyde and preserving it for life but it's about using it as a tool to communicate and you are a poet uh, and you choose your music and you choose your notes like a poet chooses their words 
to evoke something in us that we need that we don't even necessarily know that we need at the time. Uh, and you have a tremendous range of emotions to share. And you, I think you're, <laughs> I think you're a very important musician for all the reasons we've talked about. Because it's not about, it's not about the composer. It's not even about the way that the notes are on the page. It's about what the notes are intended to do. They're a gift. Music is a gift. And I think classical music has such a range of emotions and such an, a remarkable ability to communicate that I honestly believe if you continue what you're doing, you will have an effect on this. If we come back, if you and I go to a concert of any of the major uh, symphonies anywhere in the world, any of the major philharmonics anywhere in the world, if we go back and watch a concert together in 10 years, the way it's programmed will look nothing like the way music is programmed today, and the audience will look nothing like the audiences look today. A lot of gray hair will be replaced by young people who are coming to feel something, not to sit and witness history. Yeah. I really hope for that, too. As you, you are... Continue playing for your grandmother, but we are now your grandmother. Thank you, Sam. You're amazing. No, it's to you. Thank you. I didn't realize so many things before today. Good. Do you want to usher us out with something? <laughs> your dealer's choice. <laughs> you can you can play however you feel. Oh, this has been a magical treat for me. I can't even tell you. <laughs> This song, uh, maybe we can sing together. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> Perfect piece. Perfect piece to end. Leonard Cohen. <sighs> Thanks. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more optimism, check out my website, simonsinek.com, for classes, videos, and more. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.